Welcome to Solivity.com's passion-driven interviews with founder Brian Wesley Johnson. Each of these carefully curated interviews is all about supporting you and getting inspired to live your best life today. So let's get started. Here's Brian. I am so glad that you're here with us tonight because we have an amazing show in store for you. You know, before these shows, I always take some time to think about what I want to say to kind of set the tone for our guest. And sometimes it's easy um, because the subject matter is basically what we want to focus on. Other times it's not so much. And this time is a little different. So if you can, just bear with me for a while because I just want to get simple and straight and real with you guys for a minute. You know, throughout our lives, all of us have had different experiences. We felt a range of different emotions. We've been happy, we've been sad, we've been angry, joyful, or even nervous. But even through all that, there was always a lesson for us to learn and grow from, especially when those events were unexpected. We've seen other people go through similar experiences as well. I mean, the Olympics was just recently and we've seen these skiers or ice skaters reach for the gold and how that made us feel or the agony of watching a student recover from a school shooting and then becoming an advocate. Whatever the case, these events always touch our heart in a very special way. There's also the cases involving family members. Now, these are always different because they're up close and personal, right? You watch and you feel these people move through what is sometimes very painful experiences. And at the same time, you have to stay hopeful and prayerful that these people are going to be okay. Well, tonight, our show tonight is honoring my friend, Dana Ferris Fisher. We've known each other for a very long time. She is always a bright and joyful light in the world, and you're gonna see in a minute. And her recent story of pain, courage, and triumph is just a reflection of her ability to rise up and face the moment with grace and gratitude. She sees the day in what a lot of people would call tragedy. You see, in just a two-year period, Dana was diagnosed with not one, but two extreme cases of cancer, where she had to go undergo you know, extensive treatments and recoveries, all while dealing with a myriad of other difficulties. Her story is simply inspirational and it's the reason why she's with us tonight so with that i want to welcome dana to the show hey my sister how are you i'm great my brother what a lovely tribute and introduction oh it's well deserved my dear it's well deserved thank you so much um i'm so glad you're here um before we get started i want to remind everyone that you know, we love questions or even comments. So if during the show you have a question, just post it here on the live feed and we'll get to as many questions as we can during the show. I know that this is a very, very inspirational uh, uh, story and show. So if we go over, we go over, but I really wanted to make sure that Dana, that you were here and that people really heard your story and, and got that, that needed, you know, inspiration and, and all the other things that feed their soul, right? Um, where do I begin? So I really want to give, Dan, I really want to give the viewers like a sense of your journey. Um, you know, and, and from what you've shared with me, this kind of started in 2013. You know, you had a previous surgery and you start, you know, you decided I, I need a mammogram. I, you hadn't had a mammogram in a while. And so you decided to do that. What did the doctor tell you right after that? 
Well, you know what's interesting? Um, I kept saying to my husband before I even had that mammogram, you know, mm. something's wrong with me and they just haven't found it yet. And then I went wow. to have the mammogram and they saw something suspicious and decided I needed to see a radiologist for secondary screening. Mm -hmm. So the radiologist did an ultrasound and decided that what she saw was just scar tissue from my reduction surgery. So she said, oh, you're fine. Just come back in a year. And mm -hmm. off I went. Wow. Now, you probably felt good about the diagnosis. You were like, oh, well, nothing's here. But then during, during this time period, your family went through a change like a month after all of this, mm -hmm. the loss of health insurance, which is like crazy. What mm -hmm. were you feeling at this point? I mean, this, you, you know, you just got the bill of health, but now you got this news. What was going on with you then? Well, you know, I think it's a cascading effect. I mean, um, there wasn't our first job change, you know, with the economy downturn in 2008 and 2009, all of the cushion that we'd had, we used at that time. So when the job change happened in 2013, right after, it was a month after my mammogram and I was cleared and I was thinking, okay, well, now we have some difficult choices we have to make. And COBRA was just not in the budget. It was prohibitive, cost prohibitive. What was the cost for COBRA for you at that time? If we were a family of five and it was well over, it was a four figure monthly. I don't remember exactly whatever the amount was, but it was almost as much as we were paying for our monthly housing. It was really cost prohibitive. Wow. So now <laughs> you're dealing with the loss of health insurance. You're dealing with, okay, well, this is like you want the health insurance, but you can't get it right now because of the fact that it was cost prohibitive. And it's six months later. Right. So six months later, I, was, I came home from exercising and I was undressing and I felt a lump in my breast. And I thought, hmm, can you get a hernia in your breast from lifting weights? Now, I'd never heard of that. And of course, I'd already had the mammogram with something suspicious. So when I felt that lump, my instinct said okay this is a problem and you were misdiagnosed mm -hmm. and the pro the challenge at that time of course was this was pre-obamacare by the way so right. um the, the problem was what do i do now how do i get screening to even determine if this is a problem and i called around and the cost to get in to see a a doctor for it was prohibitive and even if I had done that spent the three hundred dollars or whatever it would be for the initial visit then of course you would be sent on for biopsy and another mammogram and additional screenings which I couldn't afford right so I did a bunch of uh, exhaustive internet searches and found a couple of places that would see women without health insurance in the Dallas area which is where I now live mm -hmm. and I didn't qualify for most of them because I didn't live in the right zip code or I wasn't the right religion or race or whatever it was. The two that, that said, yes, they could see me. One had run out of funding. This was in November. One had run out of funding and said to call back in January and see if wow. they had funding. And the other one had um, over a two month wait. So they wouldn't be able to see me till January either. So a friend of mine said, well, I think you should call Planned Parenthood, okay. which of course never occurred to me because I just thought Planned Parenthood was a place you went for birth control. Right, right. So I contacted my local Planned Parenthood office and they said, of course, they could get me in and that the cost for being seen was on a scale. It was based on your ability to pay. So I, 48 hours later, I went in to see the Planned Parenthood. I call her my angel, Vivian. Mm -hmm. the practitioner there and uh, she did the exam she knew immediately that I had a problem and she said I'm going to send you for secondary screening and don't worry about it we're going to pay for everything wow and she was literally relentless she called every single day to make sure that I had the right appointments and that the fees were being covered etc so the, anyway they sent me in for the biopsy and all the additional screening and uh, of course the biopsy came back positive for what my surgeon called a funky type of breast cancer. So Planned Parenthood helped me get into treatment and everything. And um, between the time that Planned Parenthood first saw me and I was diagnosed mm -hmm. and I was able to get into treatment was about six to seven weeks. Mm -hmm. And in that time, my tumor had doubled in size. 
So literally, if I had had to wait until one of those other clinics could see me, mm-hmm. I'd be dead because the tumor would have gotten big enough that it would have spread and I would have just chased it around my body until it won. Wow. Now, so two really, questions. Really now, I have two questions. Saving me. One, is this why you say that they saved your life? Absolutely. Okay. And Without the second, doubt. yeah. And the second question is this all, ha- I mean, this, at this point in your story, this stuff is, is happening at a rapid pace. What were you feeling at that moment? I mean, um, I think I was more, well, you know, when you, when somebody tells you you have cancer, first of all, it's shocking. Right. And, and so I, I think I was shocked first. And then I thought, okay, well, what do I do? I don't have health care. What, what do I do? Am I just now going to die because I don't have health care and I can't mm-hmm. afford the health care and who's going to pay for it? I knew chemo was expensive and I was sure that that's where they were going to want to send me. So I just sort of said, well, I, I don't really know what to do. And it was really Planned Parenthood that guided me through that process. Wow. Because you know, there's the circle of things you know, right? And yeah. the circle of things you don't, you know, you don't know. And then there's the circle of in the middle of the stuff you don't know, you don't know. Right, right. And so I think that was my biggest, at that point, I was just trying to figure out, well, what are my options? And I had children, so I was trying to figure out what do I tell them? Wow. And it's difficult also to tell other people what's happening with you when you're still in shock yourself and also you know they have questions and you don't have answers right you're still pro- you're trying to process everything that's going on right like wait a minute okay can i get some time over here just to kind of let this kind of ha- you know sink in with the realities of not only what you have to do but just the reality of this experience right right and not all cancer is the same right so right. one of the reasons that Breast cancer has such a sur- high survival rate compared to other types of cancer is because we've gotten sophisticated enough to be able to type the different types of breast cancer. Mm. And so depending on how your test results come back and what types of um, things they find, everyone's treatment is different. Okay. Now, I'm glad uh, you said that because yeah. the, the, it seems like the form that you had was was aggressive because the tumor had doubled in size in just six weeks. Tell, tell us about your treatment. Tell us about what, 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 you know, you had your diagnosis. Now you have to go into the treatment. You said you, you had to get chemo. Was there other things that you had to do? Right. So I had chemo first. Most people have surgery first to get the cancer removed and then they do the chemotherapy post-op, but I had it done the other way which I really appreciated actually, because then we were able to actually see the resu- the effects of the chemo on the tumor. Mm. So I had five months of chemotherapy treatment, which shrunk the tumor down. And then after that, um, they let me recover for a few weeks. And then I went in for a double mastectomy. Then mm. they let me recover a few more weeks. And then I went in for six weeks of radiation, six and a half. And then they um, asked me to recover for a few months before I had reconstructive surgery. And um, so women now, you can get two different types of reconstruction. You can get implants, which I think most people would be familiar with. Mm -hmm. A lot of women use those for cosmetic reasons. Um, Mm -hmm. And then you can also do what's called a flat procedure where they take tissue from somewhere in your body and they sort of recreate breasts. Mm. So because I had radiation, I wasn't really a good candidate for implants. So I had the reconstructive surgery and that happened um, about six months after five to six months after I had completed radiation. Okay. So you're at this point where you've completed all these things where now you've, you've had reconstructive surgery. You were probably feeling better, my, my guess. What were you feeling at this point? I mean, because it's been, what, 18 months now or so that you've gone through all these different things. What was going through? What what were you processing at that time? Well, I I think that, um, interesting question. I think that I had a false sense of um, security, right? Like, I, I think that because breast cancer is so 
well treated today and the survival rate on it is so high that people sort of assume you're going to survive. And I think I was certainly one of those people. I mean, I even had a party my last day in chemo, like, wow. oh, I'm done. I'm never coming <laughs> back here again. Um, and I, so I just assumed I was done with cancer. Like I'd had my one tour through and I would be good and I was done. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that, you know, that's God's decision, not mine. So right. clearly he reminded me he was in charge. Um, so until I started experiencing symptoms that let me knew, know that I had a problem, mm -hmm. I really thought I was done. And I was just like, okay, well, this has changed me in lots of ways, but progress, not perfection. I'm going to figure out whatever my new norm is and find a way to, to find the happiness in that new norm, whatever that was going to be. Now you, you're in this place now, you're, you're, you know, uh, where you're like, okay, well, this is my new norm and that kind of thing. It's 18 months later. What happened at this point? Right. Okay. So chemo, I was still having regular uh, menstrual cycles until I started chemo. Chemo threw me into menopause. So about a year after I had my reconstructive surgery, I started experiencing some intermittent bleeding. And then I had um, some urine leakage, some incontinence. And I've so I called the doctor and I said, you know, I'm having these problems and this really doesn't seem very normal to me, but mm. they, um, most breast cancer patients go on some form of what they call a maintenance drug. It's sort of like a low dose chemotherapy kind of a drug that they put you on for five to 10 years. Okay. So they told me perhaps it was a side effect from the drug I was taking. So I stopped taking it immediately, and, but my symptoms didn't improve. And then they did a series of different kinds of biopsies, seeing if they, because I think they knew that I had a problem, but they just didn't know where to look for it. So they kept doing these biopsies, but they couldn't find anything. And then finally, um, they sent me for an ultrasound that saw a tumor in my abdomen. Now, let me say that I happen to be a carrier of the BRCA gene. Okay. breast cancer gene, which is the same gene that Angelina Jolie has that prompted her to have the uh, preemptive surgery. Okay. So I always knew that I was going to go back and get my ovaries removed because I didn't want ovarian cancer. That's a very dangerous one. So right. before they could do the surgery anyway, um, I developed these problems and then they did this ultrasound and they saw that I had a large tumor growing in my abdomen. So when they did the surgery, they realized I had fallopian tube cancer which is not Dana. very common. Dana. Okay. So let, let's pause right there. So you've gotten to this point at which, and a part of you was saying, you know, I'm a lion, hear me roar. I beat this breast cancer thing. And now these symptoms hit and now you have this new cancer. Mm -hmm. You, okay. What was going through your mind and heart at that point? Truthfully, um, I came home and I cried. I, I said to my husband, you know, I'm dying. And mm. I'm really going to be sad for a minute about that. So because female cancers are usually not detected until they are very far gone. And the survival rate for them at best is 50-50. And when we talk about like the difference in the survival rate for breast cancer, and I talked about how they're able to differentiate the different kinds, that is not true for fallopian, ovarian, uterine, none of cervical, none of those female cancers are very well differentiated. So for example, even though I had fallopian tube cancer, I got the exact same treatment that a woman who has ovarian cancer or uterine cancer would get. There's no distinction. Wow. And so I came home and I cried and I said, I'm dying and I'm really sad about it. And um, so I, I maybe cried for an hour or whatever it was. And then I pulled myself together and said, okay, now that's done. Now what? <laughs> so, you know, um, I, when they told me after I woke up from the surgery and they said, yes, it was cancerous and we want you to do chemotherapy and all of that. And I thought to myself, I don't really want to do that again. That's a beat down. And then I realized that um, it wasn't just for me that I needed to do the chemotherapy. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, there's a 50, 50 chance it'll work or not work, whatever. But really I felt obligated to do it because I needed my family to believe no matter what happened in the end, mm -hmm. I needed my family to believe that I tried everything that I could within my power. Mm. And I think that there, that a lot of people believe that 
you're in control of a lot of these things. You know, people say, oh, pr if you pray enough or if you eat a certain kind of diet or if you meditate or what, you know. And, and I do believe that those things matter, but I don't think they make the difference between life or death. Mm. I've seen plenty of sheroes who were the most God-fearing, God-loving people who go on to get their wings. And then I've seen, you know, people who have the best diets go on to get their wings and people who drink milkshakes with mouth cancer <laughs> go on to be healthy. Like, you, you know, it just seems right. random to me. Right, right. Um, tell me about what kind of support you had through this process. Well, I think, I think that one of the great things about having, um, a challenge, whether it's cancer or another challenge is that you get to sort of, um, have these concentric circles of support is what I call them. And it's like a sieve and you get to, um, reshuffle all the people in your circle and figure out where they fall. So I stand in the center and then I have the, the most central group of, of uh, what I call my angels and then it goes out from there. So it's been a really interesting journey to see how people have moved within those circles. Wow. So there are people who are in the innermost circle and continue to stand there. There are people who I thought would be there who aren't. There mm -hmm. are people who are there that, that I didn't think would be. Mm -hmm. There are new people who've moved in in various mm -hmm. ways. And there are people who are there, be able to be there in, in different ways. So some people are there emotionally. Some people are there physically. Some people have been there financially. Um, and so it's been really interesting. Um, when something hard happens, you don't have the luxury of seeing people the way you want to see them. You mm -hmm. have to see them the way they really are. Wow. Now that sounds like that's a reflection of what you were feeling internally. You made the decision, I'm going to, in your words, I'm going to do everything in my power. Yeah, you know, I have a, a coworker who's still angry with her husband. He passed away from cancer and she's still angry with him. She feels like he didn't fight hard enough and that's why he got his wing. And that lesson, her saying that and sharing that with me, um, really made me realize that, you know, this is not just a journey for me. This is a journey for my entire family and for my friends. And if I were to say, I'm sorry, chemo's too hard and I can't do it, they would be angry with me and they would feel like you just quit. You didn't do whatever was within your control. Right. And so as hard as chemo was, and you know, if I'm, if for some reason I have to, if I get a third cancer or a reoccurrence and I have to go through it again, as much as I probably internally don't want to do it, I will end up doing it. Wow. Now let's, let's make a turn. Okay. Because it, it, because you made a turn. I mean, it started a while back with your own personal attitude and commitment to do like you just said, to do everything that you could do. There's another side of this too, that was about joy and love mm -hmm. and commune and communing with people. What did you decide to do that's around that? I think people need to hear that part. I mean, I already know, but they don't know. I, you know, there's a before, there's a, there's a before and there's an after. And at, there was a point in my journey where I, I realized that, that it was, that it was harder for me to, um, to not be open than it would have been just to be open and honest and transparent about what my journey was. It was just much harder. I mean, all of the things you know, the sort of the illusion of control, the mm. illusion of if I just do the right things, bad things won't happen to me. The embarrassment of saying, oh, I don't have health care and I don't know how I'm going to afford this or all of those things. I mean, my body isn't the same. My spirit isn't the same. And I couldn't go on pretending to be the same. Right. So when I let down and let go of all, all of those things and I just opened myself up to whatever possibilities might exist, Mm -hmm. It was a really freeing experience and I've been overwhelmed um, and really lucky by all the joy and the positivity that, that 
being my authentic open self has allowed me to experience. Wow. Um, and so I, 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 while I understand why people get in that place, um, I have found for me, it's not where I want to be. And when I sit in the, when I, when you go to the chemo room, it's a big, huge space. And there are all these patients there who are in their own battles and no one, no one ever says things like, you know, I wish I had worked more. I wish I had gotten that promotion. I mean, these are not the things that people are who are, who are in the facing death are thinking mm. about. And I realized that for me, at the end of the day, it's all about creating happiness and memories and joy as much as possible because in the end, that's really all you have. And every day was a struggle just to get through the day. And, mm. and, and so the only part that I could control, I couldn't control how I was feeling physically. Right. I couldn't control the progress of my treatment, but I certainly could control how much joy I intentionally tried to create for myself and the people around me. Wow. Wow. And you, now you did some traveling and went to different places. Were some of the places that you did, that you went to, that you had, I mean, some place, were the places that you hadn't gone to before as well? Yeah. I mean, again, I had this great, I met this great um, Shiro in the chemo room who unfortunately her cancer returned and she was dying. And when I said to her, well, what would you like to do while you're still well enough to do it? And she said, well, I've never seen the ocean. And she was 64 at the time. Wow. And that really caught me by surprise. And I, it really left an impression on me because I thought, not that necessarily seeing the ocean is everyone's dream, but whatever, your, whatever it is that is your thing, you should not wait and keep saying, you know, don't just be a dreamer, be a doer. Because wow. at the end of the day, you don't want to be sitting there saying, I wish I had. Mm -hmm. And so for me, I decided that it wasn't about going to see places, really. I mean, there are places I'd love to see, but it was really more about creating memories and experiences, particularly with the kids. Yeah. I wanted them to have memories of me that were meaningful and have time together that was meaningful. And I've really been intentional about reconnecting with old friends, spending time with people that I care about, developing new relationships. And, and truthfully, that's one of the hardest things about having cancer for me, mm -hmm. is that the physical stuff is so demanding yeah. that it doesn't create enough time and energy and life space for me to really delve into those relationships in the way I'd like to. Wow. Um, now, you're a big advocate for uh, for a lot of folks. Tell us about your advocacy. Well, particularly for Planned Parenthood. I mean, I, I you know, I, I, I don't know why, maybe it's easier. Maybe, maybe there's something in us as humans that, that where we have a need to believe that that could never be us. Like there's them and then there's us. Right. And, um, and so we don't necessarily realize, um, how we, how we, separate ourselves. And so for Planned Parenthood in particular, and in general, there's just been such an attack. And we as women just haven't, I don't know, we're just not in the places of power. We just haven't really done what we need to do to make sure that women health care needs are met in the same way, right? Mm -hmm. So Planned Parenthood in particular, I have advocated for because you don't ever know when you could be me or when your neighbor or your kid's teacher or and they treat men as well. I mean, so yeah. anybody could be me and could be find themselves, even with Obamacare. Yeah. You know, Obamacare is not a given, right? It could change. They could take away the pre-existing condition clause, and then I won't be even qualified for Obamacare. So, wow. and really, are we saying that people's ability to live should be based on their income? Is that really the kind of society we want to be? Yeah, yeah. Because, okay. I mean, again, your story is probably, I mean, there's probably other people out here that have had similar stories that might have not turned out as well as yours, giving your drive and abilities and that kind of thing. But still, the opportunity for them to receive health care in this way. No doubt. Um, 
you know, we had a quick question from somebody, and I, I guess this is a, a perfect time to kind of uh, uh, drop it in. Do people really know about the services that Planned Parenthood offers outside no. of, yeah, that's what No. Uh, Planned Parenthood is divided into two separate companies. So there's the umbrella organization of Planned Parenthood, and they have a division, a medical division, and then they have a surgical division. So the medical division is the one that provides health care, right? That's the one that saved my life. That's the one that does the cancer screenings for people with no medical insurance, et cetera. Um, and then, and they give out the birth control. And then there's uh, the surgical division, and that's the division that does abortions. Okay. And so the focus from the, pro, the, the anti-abortion side or the pro-life side, depending on how you like to look at it, okay. is strictly on the abortion part. And the abortion part receives no federal funding. It's not even housed in the same clinics where the health care part is housed. And I mean, I, I just really would like to know how killing a mother of three <laughs> is a pro-life position. Right. I just really would like for someone to explain that to me. So you take away health care from women because they can't afford private health care, and you kill mothers who already have children to try and save some potential unborn child? Right. I'm right. sorry. That's just not pro-life to me. Right. Right. And I mean, you're, you're, no one can tell you specifically that you don't know what you're talking about because you live through it. Right. <laughs> and people say, you know, people tell me all the time, oh, Planned Parenthood doesn't do that. Really? Well, I'm a living example of the fact that they do. And I've met other women through my advocacy work whose lives have also been saved or not, maybe not even, not all of them have been saved, but at least they've been prolonged right. because of the work that Planned Parenthood does. It's so unseemly to me wow. that we live in a country that where your income dictates your survival rates. I mean, really, it just, it's just wow. Unimaginable. Now, Dana, I'm going to sneak in another question because, again, this happens sometimes where the questions come in and they're like perfect for what we're talking about. This one comes from Lim. Hi, Lim. How you doing? Hi, Lim. Um, he wants to know our, let me see, let me pull it back up here. Are you, are you fearless or much less fearless now after facing death? It's a very good question. Um, I, I think that I probably am more fearless. I, I think that I, I, I'm more fearless now. I, I feel like we're all dying. None of us are going to live forever. And the difference between um, me and someone who doesn't have a cancer diagnosis is I pretty much know how I'm going. Okay. So um, I, I just have more information than the rest of you is kind of how I view it. Okay. And, um, I also feel like um, my time is limited. I mean, everyone knows their time is limited, but I think to get through the day, you sort of just don't pay attention to that. Mm -hmm. um, so since I'm more acutely aware of it, I'm definitely much more fearless. I go after what I want. I try to create the life I want. I'm intentional about every day and my time. Wow. I need some of that. <laughs> well, you know how they say time is money? Oh, no, time is everything. You get the one thing you can't get back. Um, you know, I there's one thing that makes me jealous about you, and that is you came to D.C. and you got to meet a couple of people. Who were those two people that you got a chance to meet? Right. OK, so having cancer. Look, let's be honest. Having cancer sucks. <laughs> and even the after effects, even when there's no detectable cancer, it mm -hmm. sucks. Right. On a daily basis, there it sucks. Right. But there are lots of lemonade um, that you can make with these lemons. And so one of those <laughs> is that um, I did get a chance to meet Obama because I grew up down the street. Uh, Keith Ellison, Representative Keith Ellison from Minnesota, okay. um, grew up on my street. And so when I got diagnosed with a second cancer, I called and I said, hey, look, I'm dying and I'd really like to see the White House. It wasn't even that I wanted to meet Obama. I just wanted to go and tour the White House with my kids while right. it was still Obama's house. The experiences, right? The experiences. Right, the experiences. I wanted to take my kids into the White House while the Obamas were there. Okay. And it was the Obama's house. And so um, I, I was looking for some assistance in doing that. And then Keith said, oh, no, I'll do one better. I'll introduce you to Obama and I'll take you to the Christmas party. Yeah. It was great. 
So here's an interesting part about that story. Um, so I went to this Christmas party and it was two days after my first chemo treatment. And so I was really, really nauseous and I was popping oh, anti-nausea no. pills. Oh my God. I was so nauseous. I was popping these anti-nausea pills like they were Tic Tacs. And a few times I had to step into the ladies room and I was thinking, wow. Oh God, please don't throw up all over the white house and Obama. So anyway, I'm standing in this line waiting to have my picture taken with the Obamas. And a congressperson was behind me and somehow his wife started talking to me about the dessert table. And I said to her, oh, I'm sorry, you know, I just started chemotherapy two days ago and I didn't even notice the food. I'm really nauseous. So anyway, we had this talk and I was um, explaining to them how, because I didn't have insurance and et cetera, how I was required to wait 30 days before I could have my surgery because I needed time to think about the fact that the surgery was going to make me sterile. Okay. Even though I'm 50, right. three children, previous cancer, tumor in the abdomen, et cetera, et cetera, I still needed time to think about it. Uh, and, yeah. Yeah. So this, this congressperson said he thought that was a good idea, that he thought it was an excellent idea. <laughs> Take some time to think about it. So These I was really kind officials. of flabbergasted, and um, his wife, decided to jump in on my behalf and the two of them started arguing about it and which was a good thing because I didn't want to embarrass Keith Ellison. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Anyway, wow. it was a great night. Well, I mean, I've seen the pictures. You look you looked fabulous. If if no one knew the story, they would have never known. They would have never known. Um you still need lots of support. Tell us about your angels and your GoFundMe site. Wow. You know, it's really been amazing how generous people have been. I do have a GoFundMe site, and um, my family was horrified um, when that went up. But, you know, and look, it's not something I can say that I was really comfortable with either. Or in, in, And for the most part, I don't use the GoFundMe site to raise money. The costs of the costs of treatment are unbelievable, right? right? Um, so each 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 week was about ten thousand to fifteen thousand dollars, and it's just really the costs are just remarkable. Um, so it's really impacted my family in lots of ways, and people, strangers have donated. Uh, my friends have stepped up. I mean, it's just really been heartwarming. Mm. Um, and I, I don't really even have the, the words to express it really. Um, it's just really amazing how, how generous people can be when you're open to receiving whatever love people want to give. And there are plenty of people who want to support me, but don't know how. And I think that's one of the ways they can. Okay. But I mostly use it truthfully just to share my story, where I am in the process, and to try and help people so that when they have a hard thing themselves or when they have a friend who's going through something, they have a better idea of what to say or how to support them, that kind of thing. Wow. So, so the GoFundMe has turned into a GoFundWe. So basically, you 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 said, okay, well, I've gotten this love and and support, and 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 you're using it for your advocacy and uh, getting people more aware, and you're giving back. Um, you know, with the time remaining, I want to know from you, what do you want people to know and take away from your story? I mean, what would you tell people? I think that, um, <laughs> yeah. I, I think that the most important thing at the end of the day is the personal connections. Yeah. I, I think having strong interpersonal connections and being intentional with your time and your energy and creating joy. So that, and stop dreaming and start doing because none of us really know when our time is up and you don't want to be at the end saying woulda, coulda, shoulda. Um, there, for me, there's certainly a distinction between before and after. Okay. And I think pride is something that gets 
in the way of joy. Um, and so I, I, I say to people, really be intentional and very, very intentional. Wow. Dana, um, again, when I said that it was my honor to have you on, I meant that. Um, you know, it takes just in just you being here and sharing your story takes some bravery, some bravery, courage. Um, you do it with such grace. Um, and thank you. I mean, thank you. Um, again, these are story. These are the stories that people need to hear. Sometimes it's, it's difficult for people to hear these stories because they may ask, it could be me, but that's the whole point. It could be you. And if it is you, here's a way through it. Here's a, a story that, that you can take and you can, you can go through it. You can live on, you can be intentional. So thank you for sharing. Thank you for being who you are. Thank you for being my friend after all these years it, with my silly self. Um, and, uh, you know, I want to let everybody know that we'll have Dana's Gold Fund Me or We site, her information on our website, along with this video. So please check it out, read her story. On, and, and if you're so led, donate so that she can continue to do more of this kind of work with so many people that need it. Um, so again, Dana, thank you very much for being here. Would you come back and, exactly. and, and share, you know, and let us know how you're doing and give us more, some more needed inspiration? Anytime. Mm -hmm. I think people need to really make sure that they have people surround them so that when these hard moments come, their angels are in place. Wow. Wow. So they don't have to wait. They could do it today, right? They today. Could start, they could do it today. Wow. Thanks, Dana, for that. Um, Thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, I'm going to say thanks, everyone, for joining us tonight. Um, this is Brian Wesley Johnson saying and wishing all of you a very happy, peaceful, passion-filled life full of loved ones who support you as you support them. We want to thank you for watching Solivity.com's passion-driven interviews with founder Brian Wesley Johnson. From celebrities to best-selling authors, Solivity.com is all about inspiring you to live your dreams and create your best life today. We invite you to listen to our other fantastic interviews with new ones available every single week. Please also visit Solivity.com and start your journey toward your passion, your purpose, and higher quality living. See you next time. This work is subject to copyright owned by Affinity Global LLC. Any reproduction or republication of all or part of this audio is expressly prohibited unless Affinity Global LLC has explicitly granted its prior written consent, all other rights reserved.